So welcome to SEC. It's my pleasure to introduce Joaquin Moraga, who's going to speak about topology and geometry of Kawamata log terminal singularities. So uh, thanks for the nice invitation. So as Jesus said, I will talk about uh, some recent developments about the topology and geometry of KLT singularities, which is some sort, which is a certain topic on the minimal model program. So. Um, the outline of my talk will be the following. First, I will give some uh, motivation and definitions. Then we will talk about the topology of KLT singularities. Then I will mention some uh, connections with uh, minimal log discrepancies. And finally, I will talk about the geometry of KLT singularities of full rank. Um, so maybe let's start with the definitions. Um, I will consider log pairs during this talk. So they will have the form X delta our X is a positive projective variety, which is also normal. I forgot to write that. And uh, delta is an effective key divisor such that uh, Kx plus delta is Qtar T. Okay, so we want to measure the singularities of these pairs somehow. So we pick some projective irrational morphism again from a normal positive projective variety, and we pick a prime divisor on Y. And then we define this gadget called the log discrepancy to be uh, the following number. So you see, well, this will be, I mean, here we use the fact that uh, Kx plus delta is QKT to pull it back. And this will be just some uh, real number. Well, it will be a rational number under my definition, but in general, it's just some real number. Okay, so essentially this gadget is sort of measuring the singularities along the tangent directions corresponding to E, right? E will correspond to certain tangent directions down on X, and then you're measuring the singularities along those tangent directions. So the larger this log discrepancy is, the more smooth the point is at that tangent direction. So we say that the pair is Kavanaugh log terminal if all these numbers are positive. And actually, you just need to check those that appear on a log resolution. This is some classic fact. So examples of KLT singularities are quotient singularities and cones over fan variety. So with cone, I mean cone with respect to negative Px. Okay, so these are, I mean, these are standard definitions. And finally, uh, I would like to introduce the minimal log discrepancy of a pair at a point, which is just, uh, what you look at the minimum of all the log discrepancy whose center is that point. So why this gadget, the minimal log discrepancy is so important? Well, let me, let me explain you. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Shokurov introduced two conjectures about minimal log discrepancies. So the first says that if your, if your boundary has coefficients on a DCC set, then the minimum log discrepancies will take uh, values on an ACC set. So if you think about it, this says somehow that in a fixed dimension, things cannot get more, sorry, yes. In a fixed dimension, things cannot get less and less singular. They sort of stabilize. They can get more and more, more and more singular, of course, but they cannot get less and less singular uh, with respect to this invariant at least. And the second one says that um, this invariant is lower semi-continuous on X. Okay, so, so this is also, I mean, both conjectures seems really natural and people will say that they are also pretty esoteric. <laughs> uh, however, if you look at the development of the minimal model programs in the last, I would say 20 years, I would say that the development of the minimal model program was really, I mean, sort of uh, motivated by these two conjectures. And here is the importance is that Shokuro proved that these two conjectures together imply the termination of clips, which uh, is one of the main conjectures of the MMT. Okay, so let's see some uh, results towards, oh well, and I should mention that, um, well, there has been some recent uh, results related to termination of clips, and most of those results are close to Shokuro's in original philosophy. So essentially, you, instead of using ACC for minimal log discrepancies, you replace it with some theorem that we know for instance, ACC for some log canonical thresholds. And instead of using uh, lower semi-continuity, you replace it with some sort of a junction and then you get some result, like sort of mimicking the initial approach of Shokuro. So let me mention uh, some cases in which the ACC for MLDC is, is known. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing some cases, but uh, I think these, these ones are important. So for surface singularities, this is uh, well due to Alexev and Shokurov, and they, they use the classification of KLT surface singularities. So for toric singularities, this is due to 
Ambra and Borisov, um, I think the, uh, well, I think that um, Borisov first proved it for uh, three germs and then Ambra proved it with uh, boundary in 2006. Uh, then for fixed germs with finite coefficients, these are result of Kawakita. Um, for three-dimensional canonical singularities, this is a result of Nakamura in 2016. And then uh, there was some um, recent results on exceptional singularities, uh, first uh, due to the speaker, when the coefficients have the form one minus one over n, and then by Han Liu and Shoguro um, for general DCC coefficients. So what is an exceptional singularity? Well, it's a singularity such that there is a unique divisorial valuation, which can be a log canonical place. So for instance, well, the E6, E7, E8 singularities, when you look at them, right, the graph looks like something like this. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think I should do it here. And you can see that this fork here is the only is the only divisorial valuation that can compute a log canonical place. So in other words, uh, that that you, that uh, divisorial valuation will get more singular than all the others whenever you add a boundary to the singularity. Okay. So these two results are heavily are heavily uh, well they heavily rely on BAB. So let me let me put this remark, which I think is pretty important. So in many cases, there is a really like close relation between understanding the minimal log discrepancies and understanding the local topology of the singularity. So I will proceed to explain uh, uh, why I think this is the case. So let's forget about the boundaries for a second. So if the minimal log discrepancy of x is converging somewhere. So to some, some number alpha. And let's say that it's converging in a non-trivial way. So it doesn't stabilize to alpha. Then this implies that the index of the canonical divisor is going to infinite, right? Because it's the only way in which you can get, uh, you can get a larger and larger denominators along the log discrepancies. Well, but this implies that the uh, torsion of the class group at X, of the local class group at X has size that is going to infinite so this implies that uh, the the, um, the order of the pi one of the smooth loci around X is going to infinite. So I will define this object in a second and in the last object that I wrote. So, I mean, this is one implication. If the minimal log discrepancy is converging non-trivially, then that uh, pushes your local topology to be uh, really large, okay? So, well, th then I should explain you more precisely what I mean with this local topology. So that's what you, I will proceed to, to do now. Well, of course, the, the opposite directions are not necessarily true, but that's something that, uh, that I am trying to understand. If you start from here, can you deduce something about this, right? If we, if we, if we are able to do this, then uh, this will be, uh, pretty nice, and I, I can do it in some cases that I will show you as follows. So, but first I should explain you. Uh, I should I should give you a precise definition of what I mean with the local topology of the singularities, right? So you take the germ of a log pair. So uh, during my talk I will focus on on KLT singularities, but this these definitions should work for any log pair. So you take any analytic neighborhood of uh, u of x in x, and then uh, we define this uh, regular fundamental group to be the following. Okay, there is a typo here. So this smooth shouldn't be here and it should be here. Okay, so let me explain you what this gadget is. So first of all, this lambda u is just the restriction of, sorry, this delta u is just the restriction of delta to the, to the analytic neighborhood. Okay. So maybe this is a good time to mention this, but everything that I'm talking about will be over the complex numbers. And uh, all the terms are also valid in characteristic zero if the, if the field is algebraically closed, but probably for that direction, one needs to do some extra work. Um, okay. And then 
you subtract the support of delta and you quotient by this uh, normal subgroup. So, so this uh, here is just means the, the normal subgroup generated by. And I have to tell you what this gamma p is to the NPR, right? So, so this is the loop around p, and np is the largest natural number for which this holds. So this is what I call the standard approximation of the coefficient. The standard approximation. And what I mean with the loop around p, so maybe uh, this is not uh, known. So, so you take p, right, and you look at the, the at a general point, or if you want at the generic point. So since X is normal at the generic point, this will just look like uh, AN times, or AN minus one times GM, right? So you look at the loop that corresponds to this uh, Panther disk, or I mean, to the GM, okay? So, and then how do you define the regional fundamental group of the singularity? Yes, um, talk, uh, is P and X the same point? No, no, P is a, is a prime component of the... Oh, sorry, so of course it is. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Of the boundary. So, so what is the regional fundamental group? It's just the inverse limit of all these, uh, of all these groups where U runs over all possible analytic neighborhoods. And one can see that it's, it's it stabilizes because well, the, the PLT singularity, well, the singularity will be algebraic, so it has a CW uh, complex, complex structure, so this will stabilize. And you will have a final presentation. Um, and some uh, recent breakthrough by Lucas Brown is that the regional fundamental group is a KLT uh, of a KLT gem is final. This was proved uh, earlier this year. Okay, so another question is what, what else can we say about this regional fundamental group of a KLT gem? We know it's final. Can we say something stronger? Okay, so let me give you a silly example, like um, what happened for the log smooth germ. So you can compute really easily that if you take the, the smooth point with the, the coordinate hyperplanes and you look at the regional fundamental group of zero, you just get this, uh, this group of rank N, well, if the rank will be less than N depending on the, CM, the CIs, um, but it's abelian, that's the important part. And here MI is just the standard approximation of the CI. So, if you if you didn't follow the, the maybe the um, definition really well, you can think about the following remark. I mean, actually, this is how I think about the definition. I usually don't think about the definition itself. So, if you have a germ, then the normal subgroups of this regional fundamental group corresponds to Galois covers in which the pullback remains a log pair and X has a unique preimage. So, for me, Galois covers are not necessarily are not necessarily at all. So they are, essentially, they are just quotients by automorphic, finite automorphism groups. Okay, so this is the way I want. I, I like to think about it. So if you if you just think about this perspective, this becomes totally obvious, right? Because uh, well, you just use purity of the branch loci, and you know that you can only ramify along these guys uh, with with this coefficient by Hurwitz formula. Okay, so. So now let's start talking about the Jordan property. So the Jordan property says the following. If you have a finite group in GLNC, uh, then you can find an abelian normal subgroup of rank at most n and then index Cn that is bounded by, I mean, Cn is a constant that only depends on the dimension. Okay, so actually I should mention that Collins uh, recently proved, so I think this is 2010, he proved that Cn, you can take Cn to be n factorial for n larger than 71. Okay, but let's not, um, well, I, I don't think what happens up to 70, but let's not get stuck there. So you can rephrase the, the above theorem as follows. So you take a quotient singularity, then you can say that there exists a, an exact sequence of the following type, right? Where A is an abelian, is abelian of rank at most N and index at most CN. So I'm just, um, rephrasing the above, the above theorem using topology. So even more as a corollary, you can say the following. If you, have, if you have a quotient singularity, then there exists a Galois morphism from a toric singularity uh, that you can choose to be Q factorial. And the, de the degree of this uh, Galois morphism is at most Cn. So how do you see this? 
Well, you have the you have the A is an abelian action on a smooth germ, so you can always diagonalize this action. And then after diagonalizing this action, you can quotient, and then the quotient will be a p factorial toric singularity. So essentially, this theorem says that, I mean, the way that I like to phrase it is like quotient singularities are almost toric. And of course, these are really old fact. So it is really natural every time that you have a problem of quotient singularities, you try to, to prove the toric case first, and then you try to uh, understand this bounded quotient. Okay, so now let's go to the first main theorem of this talk. Uh, this is the Jordan property for KLT singularity. So essentially, we want to just general, generalize this exact sequence from quotient singularities to all possible KLT singularities. So there exists a constant satisfying the following. Okay, so here the constant only depends on, on n. So you take the germ of a KLT singularity of dimension n, and there exists an exact sequence where a is a villain of rank at most n and index at most cn. So, so this is the sentence saying that the order of, of n is cn. So why we choose these names? Because you can think about it well, um, a is the abelian part of the local topology and n is the non-abelian part of the local topology. So this says, I mean, philosophically this says that uh, KLT singularities and quotient singularities are almost the same, at least from some, some topological perspective. Well, of course, it's, it will be almost impossible to compute higher homotopy groups, but um, at least from pi one, they're really similar. Mm, so, so, um, Nice corollary that you can get out of the above theorem is the following. If a finite group acts on a KLT algebraic variety X with a fixed point, um, then G contains a normal abelian subgroup of rank at most N and index at most CN. So while well, the proof is really simple, using the theorem, you just take Okay, so uh, let me tell you at least what is the idea of the proof of this term. So, I mean, of course, the, the proof is a bit involved, but uh, let me at least tell you um, what are the main ingredients. So first you start with a finite variety of dimension n minus one. So that n minus one there should sort of tell you that I will use induction. So, so you can find a point E on the, on the finite variety such that the natural morphism, so this is just the inclusion of the point inside, inside the phenotype variety, and then you take uh, pi one, is almost rejected. So the index of the image is bounded by a constant on the dimension. Okay, so this is actually uh, pretty straightforward from the work of Prokhorov and Shramov on finite automorphism of rationally connected varieties. So this is a very special point on your phenotype variety. Um, so now uh, we will go to KLT singularities and we will try to use the, the, the first step. So now you, you go up on the dimension. So now you have an n-dimensional KLT germ and uh, you do this PLT blow up construction. So essentially what you do is you do some special blow up at your singularity that will extract a unique exceptional divisor which is a phenotype variety. And of course, that finite variety, we want to be this E that we were talking about in the first step. Uh, and E comma delta sub E will be the induced uh, log pair that in the log pair that is induced by a junction the exception. So you have an exact sequence like this. Um, and this exact sequence follows from the theory of weakness stratification. So I should tell you what this V is. So this V is an open analytic subset of X uh, for which there is a surjection to the, I should say, region of fundamental group here. So let me explain you more or less um, how this happens. Uh, maybe I don't have much space here, but I will draw it like really little here. So you have your X in X and then you do this uh, extraction of a polar component. I mean, this is some name that, that we give it to it. And and you know that E is of phenotype. And then uh, from the theory of witness certifications, you have a retraction 
uh, from the neighborhoods, from an analytic neighborhood here to E. Well, when you take the pre-image here, this analytic neighborhood will retract into, into E. However, this analytic, this, uh, this retraction is really, I mean, it's not, it's not algebraic, of course. And so, I mean, all the fibers have the same dimension and the fibers have dimension equal to the dimension of X. So if you think about it, this retraction is, is, not, a, is, is, is not a nice algebraic retraction. So, but something that uh, Ching Yang Xu proved in, in, in his finiteness paper about uh, the profinite completion of these groups is uh, um, actually this retraction behaves nicely. It's, it's an orbifold bundle if you restrict to, to some analytic subset of this. Well, it's really hard for me to draw it. So, so let's just call it B. And the important property that this uh, analytic open subset has is that it's Phi one still surjects into the regional one. Okay, maybe this part is sort of uh, is is not really easy to see, but let's let's go with. So the important property of this orbifold disk bundle is that it trivializes over an open set of E. So it becomes a, a trivial uh, disk bundle, not orbifold anymore. And this homo this homomorphism but that we had uh, from the point, so this point that accumulates almost all the topology of the phenotype variety is still almost rejected. So after you you shrink to this open open set of E that uh, on which the orbital this bundle is trivial, then you still have the, the the point E the point E almost accumulates all the topology. Uh, here there is a problem that this group may not be finite because we may delete codimension one points of E. Uh, uh, however, such a group is still a billion of rank n minus one. So actually, uh, here I'm hiding uh, some some tricky part of the proof. Okay, um, but let me let me uh, skip those details. So now we have we have this exact sequence, right? And we have also this splitting. Well, it will be a trivial bundle, so you will have an splitting. So all, all that I, I, I say so far gives you the following commutative diagram. So this is the orbifold disk bundle. Uh, this, this is where it trivializes. Um, this is the point that accumulates almost all the topology. And this is the guy that we want to prove the Jordan property of. Um, and the important part is that all the arrows that are vertical in this picture are surjective or almost surjective. So you prove the surjectivity of this one with the four lemma, the surjectivity of this one is, is by the previous step, and the surjectivity of this one is by the second step. So, and we know that this is a billion of rank at most n minus one. And well, when you when you ask the, the other set, then it will become a billion of rank at most n, and then you will have a almost subjective morphism from something that is a billion of rank n. So that will give you the theorem. Okay. Well, it says induction on the dimension because I use induction on the dimension to do. I mean, you you need you don't need the induction on the dimension for the first step, but you apply it to the first step. Okay. So this is the idea of the proof of the first theorem. So some corollary of this is that if you have a KLT singularity, the local class group that, ah, oh, okay. It should say the torsion of the local class group contains a subgroup of rank at most N and the index at most CN. So in particular, the torsion of the local class group is generated by at most BN elements for all KLT singularities of the same dimension. So again, here CN and BN are constants that only depends on N. So let me ask a question that I, I don't know how to answer, and I will I would really like to have an answer of this one. So how we can can characterize the points of phenotype varieties which accumulates almost all the loops? So in the proof you saw that there was this point on the phenotype variety that uh, almost rejects into pi one to the whole uh, fundamental group of the of the orbifold phenotype variety. And uh, I don't know I don't know how to characterize these points. I, well, I don't know even if there is a nice characterization. I suspect that there is something related to the minimal loop discrepancy. Some implications of the form, if the point has minimal loop discrepancy or the log discrepancy is small enough, then, then it will surject. I mean, its region of fundamental group will almost surject into the fundamental group of the finite variety. 
but I'm not so sure that's the right direction. But in any case, it should be interesting to understand. It. So another question is the following. So what about the center of this pi one? So from our proof, it follows that the loop around the exceptional divisor, so this, uh, well, maybe it shouldn't go back because it will be too slow. But in this exact sequence that we have before, we have something like this. And this, this ZM is the loop generated by the around the exceptional divisor. So essentially you have the, let's do it like this. You have E and then you have the loop gamma here and the generated by gamma is, is this uh, ZM. And something that follows from the proof is that, is that that loop around the exceptional divisor uh, lies in the center. So I think a question that I ask myself and I don't know how to answer yet is, uh, do all possible PLT blow ups and all loops around the exceptions generate the center? And I think if this is true, it will be, uh, it will be a really interesting result. Okay. So we expect that the Jordan property for KLT singularity should have uh, nice implications on the study of minimal log discrepancies. Um, for now, I can show you uh, that the Jordan property for GLN help us to understand minimal log discrepancy. So, so this is a term uh, that I proved recently that ACC for MLDs of n-dimensional quotient singularities will hold on some small interval around zero. Um, and of course, this interval will shrink when you go up on the dimension. So actually, I think that for quotient singularities, you can take epsilon n to be one over n factorial. And I mean, this is essentially due to this result of Collins in 2010. Um, so let me explain you uh, what is the idea of the proof of, of this theorem. So as we saw before, we have a Galois quotient of degree at most cn. So this is the quotient by the non-abelian part. So if you assume that the minimal of discrepancies between zero and CN inverse, then this will imply that, um, well, first you can assume that CN inverse is less than one. So you can extract the divisor um, competing the minimal of discrepancy by VCHM. And then you can consider the base change and you get an, an, an M equivariant projective by Russian morphism. I mean, making the obvious commutative diagram on the picture. So since the minimal log discrepancy is in this interval by the formula of log discrepancy with respect to, to five covers, you deduce that the discrepancy of every prime divisor extracted on T prime will be in zero one. So what is the point here is that we know that T is a toric germ and all these valuations will be non-terminal. So if they will have log discrepancy on the interval zero one. Uh, so they must be toric valuations. So we conclude that the, this morphism T prime to T is actually a toric morphism. So it's a projective by rational toric morphism. Okay, but we are not done yet, right? Because the non-abelian part will still change your minimal log discrepancy. For, for as small the question is, I, I think you can even hook up involutions that when you question by an involution, uh, you will get a smaller minimal log discrepancy. So, I mean, this is the, this is the point. Now you consider an, an not to be the maximal normal subgroup that acts on the identity on the exceptional. So, so let's think uh, about this for a second. Imagine that you have a blow up, right? So let's think about the, the simpler case. Okay, so you blow up the smooth point on the projective space, right? And then you have GLN acting on the base and uh, which, which automorphisms will lift and will act, well, the whole GLN will lift, uh, but which ones will act as the identity on E? Well, you can see that essentially that's the GM that is acting vertical. There is a unique GM that is acting vertical here, right? Um, so the idea is to use something like this. So we prove that N conjugates inside a one dimensional torus of T. So, I mean, this is actually not true or it's not known to be true in the fine coordinates. So to prove it in the fine coordinates, you will need to prove the linearization conjecture. So it's pretty hard. But if you go to the local completion, you can prove this. And this is where I'm hiding uh, most of the difficulty of this paper because uh, in general, if you, have an, if you have an automorphism group or I mean, or any reductive group, proving that something conjugates inside the torus is, is, is not an easy problem. 
but but now it's since well up to an automorphism we can assume that this n naught is inside the is inside a one dimensional torus so you can question by a naught and then you get a formally toric uh singularity because you you question by something that on the local completion is inside the torus okay so T naught is a still uh, is a still toric somehow. I mean, from from the perspective of minimal log discrepancy, it's a still toric. And then one shows that that the minimal log discrepancy one change uh, after taking this question. And this proves the statement because we know ACC by Boris of a number we know ACC for torics. But of course, um, but of course I need at least this condition, and I think this condition suffices. So, okay. So the above theorem is actually proved in the paper in a in a slightly more general setting. So, so it's proved for toric quotient singularity. So essentially, it's the quotient of a toric singularity by a finite group. Of course, uh, quotient singularities are toric quotients, but not all toric quotients are are quotient singularities. For instance, you can think about uh, an involution acting on on the on the Rational double, the rational double point. And I think that one is toric quotient, but it's not quotient. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. So, well, I, I, I shouldn't say that the following is an application. It's actually another theorem I'm working on. So, so the above theorem says that ACC for MLDs holds for quotient singularities around zero. So the following theorem says that you can do better. Uh, you can just uh, forget about the fixed, I mean, the, the smooth germ, but now you can say for a bounded family. So you start with a bounded family of singularities. So, so what I mean with a bounded family of singularities, this essentially means that you have some uh, finite type uh, algebraic variety X such that uh, for any, um, Okay, here my notation will get really messy because I have too many axes on the picture. So let me call this x hat. So for any x in x, a singularity in this family key, then the local completion uh, will be isomorphic to the local completion. God, okay, sorry for this, guys. <laughs> for some singularity, for some point x hat in x. Okay, no, well, it's not that ugly. I think it's pretty understandable. Okay. So you have this bounded family of singularities. There exists a constant that only depends on the bounded family, uh, such that AC, ACC holds for minimal log discrepancy on the interval 0, 0, c for singularities of the form x quotient by g, where x belongs to, to the bounded family. Well, maybe I should be more precise and write x in x belongs to the bounded family. And g is an automorphism that fixes x. So, um, ACC will hold for uh, all questions of bounded families. Of course, I cannot put coefficients into this theorem because even for a smooth point with DCC coefficients, this conjecture is really hard in dimension three. And I think that, so, so let me mention this. I think that ACC has two sort of flavors. One flavor is X complicated, no, no delta. And the other, the other, the other flavor is X is simple, for instance, you can think uh, X is smooth point and, and delta is complicated. So you can see from what I've been talking uh, is that I, I, I mostly care about this part. Um, and I think for a termination of flips, the left part should suffice. If I remember well, she could have space. But this is also part of the conjecture. And uh, I think that an uh, entirely different set of arguments will, will, will be needed for that direction. Okay, so um, are there any questions so far? Well, if not, well, I will continue. So maybe I have some questions. Yes. So let me let me ask more questions. So so if you have a question singularity, you can uh, well write the well write it as a question. So that's really clever. And um, and you can take the abelian part and the non-abelian part. So something I would like to understand, which uh, my proof up there uh, sort of implies, or at least implies in some cases, is that, is it true that only A can change the minimal of discrepancy? Is, is it true that only the abelian part of the, of, 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 of the group can change the minimal of discrepancy? Uh, I think the, this question is, is, seems naively to be wrong. However, I think that 
for most cases, this should be right, right? We, for, for finite groups of GLN, this is some sort of discrete object. So there should be, there could be some statement that says that that is almost always true. And then one can ask the same for KLT singularities using the Yorton property, but I think this, this will be out of reach uh, for now. So some other question that is related to all of this is the following. Imagine that you have a KLT singularity with an effective transaction that fixes the point of interest. And now you take a final group acting on it, again, fixing X. And there is no relation between the torus and G a priori. So, uh, so is it true that there exists a normal abelian subgroup well with the conditions above that satisfies the following? So A splits as AB plus AH such that uh, the vertical part is inside the torus and the horizontal part descends to the normalized chalk portion. I think this is a super natural question and I can prove it for a fine toric varieties. Um, but the proof was uh, actually non-trivial. So I think that it will be interesting to prove this geometric Jordan property in, in general. Okay. So now uh, I will start converging to the, to the final part of this talk. Um, in which I have to introduce some, some new objects. So I will try to do it a bit slow because the, these are things that, at least for me, require a, a bit to understand. So we say that a phenotype variety is log Crepin equivalent toric. And if, if anyone has any suggestion on how to make these names shorter, I will be uh, really glad. If there exists a boundary V on X, so that XB is log Crepin equivalent to uh, PN, H. So essentially what I'm saying here is that you have XB uh, and you have a, com a common log resolution such that um, if you pull back, right, if you pull back KX plus B, you get KY plus BY, which is equal to pi two pull back of PNA. Of course, I mean from this definition, something that you can, if you if you if you know some basic toric geometry, you say, okay, all torics are log Crepin equivalent torics. Well, that's true. Uh, however, of course, there are log log Crepin equivalent torics which are not toric, right? You just take uh, P two and then with uh, the three lines, and then you start blowing up these points, right? You don't blow up the points of intersection. You can blow up as many of these as you want, and you are still log Crepin equivalent toric. If you are lucky enough, you will still be a phenotype. And then that will give you a local panic equivalent toric, which is not toric. Okay. So we will we will say LCT for short. So we say that a KLT germ is log Crepin equivalent toric if it is the orbital cone over a log Crepin equivalent toric Fano variety. In this case, we say that X in X is LCT again. And finally, we say that a KLT theorem is log Crepin equivalent toric quotient, or LCTQ for short, which is not very short, uh, if it is the finite quotient of a LCT theorem. So uh, let me give you a simple example of an uh, LCTQ theorem which is not which is not toric. So I mean, one example is the following. So if I remember well, it was something like this plus Z. W equals zero inside um, A4. Yeah, I think this, this, well, actually, maybe I need some weights here, but something of this sort will be, um, will be LCTQ, but it's not a toric jam. Okay. So, so I mean, th these definitions seems really like um, made up. So let me explain you why you think these are really natural. So, so if you look at exceptional phenotype varieties and you look to a different Crepin model of your exceptional phenotype variety, uh, it remains exceptional. So let me explain you what exceptional phenotype variety is. It's a phenotype variety X such that for, for every boundary that you can find V so that Uh, so that, oops, sorry. So that is LC and KX plus B is Q trivial, then actually X comma B is KLT. So an exceptional phenotype is essentially a phenotype in which you do not create local canonical centers 
on a local Abiyao structure. Of course, you can create local canonical center if you, if you take higher multiples of negative key x, but if you want to give it local Abiyao, you cannot create local canonical centers. And this already happens for P1. If you choose P, if you choose P1 with certain weights, you can make it exceptional. Okay. And some important pro, uh, property of the exceptionals is that um, of exceptional finite varieties uh, is that they are close undertaking these log Krepan equivalent models. So some other important property of exceptional singularities is that they are close undertaking covers and questions. So. So what happens if you apply these two sort of algorithm to toric singularities? Well, you get LCETQ singularities. So these are the closure of toric singularities with respect to changing the LCE model and taking covers and quotients. So, so from my perspective, this should be the two opposite kinds of, of KLT singularities. So if you look at the KLT uh, spectrum, the exceptional should sit on, on one side and then the LCETQ should sit on the other side. So, so how do you compare them? For instance, the, the rank of the of the fundamental group here, the rank of pi one is, is usually just Z or sorry, Z can. So the, you may have more stuff, but the other stuff is, is bounded with respect to the dimension. So LCDQ in general, the rank of the pi one will be I mean, in general, they will be like ZM to the K, oh, sorry, to the, to the N, where N is the dimension. Uh, if, you, if you want to think about log canonical places, there is one log canonical place. And in the LCDQ world, many, right? I mean, you, you have a whole dual complex of full dimension in general. So I'm, I'm talking about some sort of general choice of your LCETQ. Um, well, from the theory of complements, they are also pretty different. And um, algebraically, they are also pretty different. But, um, but th that's the point. So one natural question is, uh, do these two classes sort of generate all KLTs in homogularity somehow? Well, the, the answer is no, but I think the, the class that is generated by these two by taking products, um, questions and covers is pretty large. So it should, it should, I mean, it should give us a, a because I think one of the main problems of, of studying KLT singularities is that we don't have any, any gadget or any class of singularities that if you have a theorem, you test it on that class and then you say, okay, maybe this holds for all KLT singularities. So, so, if you test something for exceptionals and it works, it can it can uh, fail for toric singularities and fail for LCTQ singularities. And if you test it for LCTQ, it can it can fail for exceptionals. But my feeling is that these two extremes are so different that if you if you can prove some theorem about KLT singularity for both of them, it is pretty likely that uh, that with some hard work you can you could prove it for all KLT singularities. So that's why, why I think that, um, well, we have ACC here now and we have, well, we don't have ACC here. So I think it will be really interesting to have ACC on the right side. Of course, I have examples of KLT singularities. These examples are easier, oh, sorry, are, are pretty hard to explain here, but there are examples of KLT singularity which are not sort of mixed type exceptional LCDQ. So of course, like mixing these two these two sort of singularities won't cover all KLT singularity, but I think they will cover enough to sort of uh, test conjectures. Okay, so I mean that was uh, I mean maybe a little bit of a brainstorm, but let's keep going. So so what can we say about the geometry of Kawamata log terminal singularity of full rank? So first let me tell you what I mean what I mean with full rank. So I told you before that. There is an exact sequence like this, right? Region of fundamental group X, delta X, and here you have the non-abelian part. And this is essentially, well, let's write ZM to the uh, to the K where uh, K is less than or equal than N. Of course, it, it doesn't have this form, right? You, you may have different summons, but for simplicity, let's uh, assume it looks like that. So as I told you before, the exceptional ones have K equal one. And, and those we understand very well. 
So what happens if we go to the opposite side? What happens if we force k to be n and we take m large? So essentially, um, so essentially what I am asking is what if we force the topology of the KLT singular to be as large as possible? So will this imply something geometric? And well, of course, this term will give the answer. So, so let's see. So there is a constant that only depends on n satisfying the following. So you take a KLT singularity of dimension n, and then you look and assume that it has, there is a huge lattice, discrete lattice, sorry, discrete finite lattice inside the, the regional fundamental group. And this m is larger than this constant. Then x comma b degenerates to an LCTQ singularity. So essentially, all singularities with maximal topology are the formations of LCTQs. So the above theorem follows from the, the following projective theorem. Um, if you, well, same setting, if you, you take this constant and now you assume that your phenotype variety has really large automorphism group, um, but finite. So again, a, a finite big lattice. So then X is log Lagrangian equivalent to it. So let me explain you, oh, wait, there is a furthermore. Furthermore, X admits an open set isomorphic to EM and to, to, to an algebraic torus um, on which this by rational morphism, sorry, by rational map will be an isomorphism. So essentially I'm saying that all phenotype varieties that have uh, maximal rank automorphisms, discrete maximal rank automorphisms will be compactifications of the algebraic torus. And of course one will, I mean, you see both terms have this n here. So this is the full rank case because the, the, the rank is as large as it, as it can get. So you can also ask me what happens in the intermediate rank case. Uh, um, I will show you in a sec. Okay, so let me go through the proof of this. So it is actually a really involved proof. So maybe, maybe I, I will just go through it and, and you can ask the details at the end if you have any questions. So you, let's just call this AM. So AM will be this uh, set M uh, to the N. So first you find an invariant, AM invariant and complement of X. Okay, so this is essentially a boundary V such that KXB is log canonical and KX plus B is linearly equivalent to zero. And this guy is AM invariant. So something that I prove in this paper is that you can choose this n independent of m. Okay? So a natural question that you should ask yourself, what happens if you take the limit of m going to infinite? What will happen to your boundary? So actually the, the, the outcome of doing this, which is sort of part of the proof, is that b becomes reduced. Sorry, uh, well, all the coefficients converge to one. So actually you can do some computations on P1 and, and check that this is, this is the case on that, on that example. Okay, so here only N only depends on the dimension and we denote this by V. So we have this, so essentially what I say. So then we, we replace X with an A M equivariant terminalization X prime prime. Okay, so I think this, this is just one prime. And then we run a minimal model program for for again kx prime, which is am equivariant. So it will terminate with an am equivariant modifiable space. Okay, this was x prime prime. This is x prime. This is x prime. Okay. So the the am action will split in the general fiber and the base. So I mean this takes some computation, but you can see that it will split nicely. So so you will have a z di dimension of the base. M acting on, on, on C and Z dimension of F M acting on the general fiber. Um, this requires some argument, but it's not too hard. Uh, so, so you can apply induction. Okay, but let's not apply induction yet. Let's think what happens in the case that C is a point. So in the case that C is a point, so this is the bounded case. Well, K X prime prime is AM invariant, and you have that row AM X prime 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 is one because it's 
is an AM equivariant Mori fiber space. So you conclude that negative KX frame prime is ample, but also you have that X frame prime is terminal. So you can apply VAB and conclude that this X frame prime belong to a bounded family. Okay. So now we have this AM inside this automorphism group and we, we, we can increase M, right? As, as far as we are, we, we replace by bounded, um, as far as we replace by bounded uh, a multiples, we can increase M. And we want to argue that X prime prime, B prime prime is toric. Well, the important part here is that this X prime prime, B prime prime belongs to a bounded family of linear algebraic groups. Well, the reason is that this guy is a subgroup of this one. Well, it's exactly the subgroup that, uh, that fixes B prime prime. You don't need to fix it component wise, but you need to map components with the same coefficient to components of the same coefficient. But uh, since X prime prime is anti-canonically polarized, then you know that uh, out X prime prime is, uh, is linear algebraic. So out X prime prime B prime prime is linear algebraic. So you can assume up to uh, thinking M in a bounded way, you can assume that it's inside the connected component. Then you quotient by the radical unipotent and you can assume that AM belongs to a finite family of reductive groups. Because after you quotient by the, unical, the, the radical unipotent, of course the radical unipotent doesn't contain semi simple elements, so you don't kill anything of AM. So AM just got maps like a, a isomorphically to the quotient. Um, and why is this finite family? Well, because, because you have a family of reductive groups that has bounded dimension, so it will, have, it will, be, it will be finite up to isomorphism, of course. Too. So we may assume that um, AM is inside G for a fixed reductive group. So now you look at the action of AM into the quotient by the Borel subgroup. So this is the Borel subgroup. And we know that these are rationally connected variety. So by the results of Procura van Schramhoff, really similar to this point on the Faraday variety that accumulates almost all the topology, you can conclude that AM acts on, on G quotient B with a fixed point. Well, here you may need to shrink AM again, but again, the way that you need to shrink is in, in a bounded way. So you conclude that AM is contained in the Borel subgroup, but if you have a semi-simple, uh, a group generated by semi-simple elements in the Borel subgroup, it conjugates into the maximal torus. So you will have that uh, ZMN is contained into the maximal torus T, but this, this will imply that the rank of T is equal to the dimension of N, and this will imply that X is toric. X prime prime is toric. And well, actually the boundary will be toric as well because the, the um, ZMN will fix, I mean, this T actually will be an automorphism of X prime prime, B prime prime. Okay, and then um, to prove the furthermore, you need to do some, some, some analysis of, of the MMP going back to X. So to, to actually prove that you preserve the torus in this process. So that's not hard, but it requires some arguments. So let me show you briefly what you do in the modifier space case. So first, uh, so here the main point is try to use this gadget called the complexity, which is the dimension of X prime prime plus the Picard rank minus the, the, the coefficients of the components on the boundary. Okay, if this is zero, then we win because by, uh, by, um, BM, Z, um, McKernan, S. Baldi, Zhang, and I don't remember the first author. Oh, Brown. Brown, McKernan, S. Baldi, and Zhang. Uh, we will know that this is um, this is story. But okay, so we first we can apply the hypothesis induction on the general fiber to the disk that is log toric, and then we can apply the the inductive hypothesis to C, and after recompactifying, we can assume that C is the projective space as well. So now we have the general fiber story and the basic story. However, of course, this may not be toric, right? You, you can cook up many examples of, 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 of A invariant, AM invariant uh, modifier spaces with toric base, general fiber, I mean, yeah, toric base, uh, general fiber toric, but it's still not toric. Okay, so we need to control this gadget and this gadget. So this gadget, as I told you before, is essentially the number of components of B prime prime. By, by this uh, argument taking the limit. Okay, so, so let's see what goes wrong. Okay, sorry, I say that this you cannot do. Well, this can, you cannot control. Of course, this is fixed. 
So why I cannot control that draw? Because we are an, an equivariant modifiable space. So we control the equivariant pick a run, but we have no idea what draw it could be. It could be unbounded. So first we quotient to get an, uh, an actual modifiable space that we call Y. And then we would like to apply the complexity to this guy. However, you, you lose control on the prime components, right? Because, well, there could be two prime components that are horizontal on X prime prime, but when you quotient, well, they become the same component. So, so your counting will go wrong again. So, I mean, this is the reason that there could be some prime component on the general fiber or two prime components that are actually the same prime component on the ambient space. So, I mean, that will place against you and will show you that the complexity is not zero. So now you start taking uh, the essentially, well, the, um, you look at the Stein factorization from the components of the Y to the base, and then you take the cover corresponding to the, to the finite part. So this will give you a, a new model Z to TZ after doing this um, cover. And you can prove that actually the base is still bounded. Well, I have two minutes, but the proof will, will finish soon. So again, since you take covers, rho C may be large again. But, but you know that all the toric boundaries from the general fiber extends. So this actually gives you a, a really strong constraint and will allow you to control certain minimal model programs. So the plan is to run a minimal model program on Z over the base and afterwards actually show that the minimal model is toric. And analyzing this MMP, one can prove that actually Z is toric. So you see that to prove that something is toric, we need to caution first and then take cover, and then we get something toric. So, so that's really far from proving that X prime prime is toric. So let me show you uh, what happens afterwards. So you, ha you have a diagram like this. You started from the AM equivariant um, modifier space. Then you quotient. Then you take covers. And then you just complete this diagram because uh, you want to have something that dominates X prime prime. So you know that's historic, and one can prove that this morphism is unramified over the torus. So that is historic. And then one proves that this, this group H0 that realizes X prime prime as a quotient is normalized by a large discrete subgroup of the torus. So that implies that H0 must lie in the torus. So X prime B prime is toric. And this concludes the proof. Well, of course, then one needs to check that this is an isomorphism over the torus, but again, it is really similar to what you do in the bounded case. Okay, so let me finish with some questions. Well, it says that I have two more slides. Okay, now, well, this, this is the theorem in the intermediate rank case. So maybe I will just scroll through it because, um, uh, well, I, I don't think that I have time to explain. But essentially, one can also prove this in the intermediate rank case with an extra condition related to the regularity uh, of, of the phenotype variety. So let me finish with, with these questions. So first, one can ask about the bounds on the, on the whole tag. And I can tell you that up to dimension, I mean, up to this, this bounds with n equal 3, I expect that all of these are small numbers. 60 or 120 should make it. Uh, but if you look at C4, I expect this to be really large. In general, I think that 3n factorial should be a reasonable, reasonable bound. And this is just, uh, well, again, a lot of daydreaming. I don't know how to prove anything close to this. But I'm pretty sure some factorial will approve in the upper bound. Uh, so what is the cardinality? Well, this is related to the above questions. I think this, this will be the natural question to tackle the, the question above. What is the cardinality of the largest alternating group acting on an n-dimensional KLT singularity? So I think one natural way to look at is to look at local complete intersection first. And in that case, I can construct things, uh, KLT, local, local complete intersections, we have an, um, an action of alternating group A3N. So that, that's why I have this bound here. And I think that, well, there, there is a lot of recent development with K stability and normalized volume to understand KLT singularities. So I think this question is really interesting as well, and maybe it could make merge these two worlds together, uh, characterized K-stable and K-semi-stable LCETQ fan varieties. And I actually think this is pretty pretty doable in dimension two and three. And uh, maybe one can, can like merge these two different approaches to a static LT singularities in a single approach. And 
Okay, I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, we have maybe a couple of minutes for questions. You can unmute yourself and ask directly if you have a question. No? Uh, okay, well, since we are running out of time, I want to thank you, Joaquin. Thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive talk. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, see you next week.